Okay, well, Ashley, Kathy, and Stuart, if you're okay, I think we may as well start. Um, everyone who's joined, uh, we are still waiting for one of our panelists, Brian Dean, but I'm pretty sure he'll be with us shortly. So I think if we just crack on. Uh, uh, my name is Anjana. I'm a BBC sports and news presenter. Uh, I also I play football and my children play football so, as well. So I'm now very involved with the grassroots as grassroots side of the game as well as the, uh, the higher edge reporting on the, the higher level. Um, we are, this is the second session of the Sustainability Index Explained, uh, which I'm sure most of you already know. Um, it's just part of Fair Game's proposal to, to reboot the game, to make sure that the, the huge amount of funds in football go to the clubs that are the best run, giving those clubs a huge incentive to make sure they are well run. Um, so there, there are four pillars for, they want the things that the, the Fair Game is proposing is that the funding's based, is distributed based on how well they, they, how well they perform in four key areas, financial sustainability, um, equality standards, good governance, and fan and community engagement. And there are four panel discussions on each of those four pillars. One we're looking at today is um, the equality standards. And so we've got four great panelists tonight who are gonna talk a bit more, their own experiences, try to enhance all of our knowledge about what can be done, what is being done, and hopefully help fair game as they move on with their proposals. Um, so we have, first of all, Cathy Long. Uh, she's got 30 years in policy. She's got numerous, numerous hats, uh, working in fan advocacy roles um, at the Premier League, uh, the Football League, Women in, Foot, Women in Sport, the Football Supporters Association, and numerous others. Uh, we've also got Stuart Fuller here, who's the, the chair of the, the fan owned club, Lewis, um, the first semi-professional club to offer equal Paying, playing budgets and resources to men and women. Uh, so it's great to have you on board, Stuart. And we've also got Ashley Mould, who's from Lane, Clark and Peacock, um, from the football and analytics team, who over the course of a year and a half, Ashley, you've helped make Transfer Lab, which is part of, of LCP, uh, the first comprehensive data scouting platform for women's football. So huge achievements. So we've got some, some great, great, great uh, different perspectives on the game itself. Um, we've got some sponsors, Transfer Lab, who are Ashley's employers, so uh, thank you for providing Ashley, um, and Campbell Tickell as well. Just a bit of housework, or oh, housekeeping, sorry, on your chat, on your screen, if you have got any questions you want to put to any of our panellists, please do. Um, we'll have a little uh, opportunity a bit later on to put questions to the panellists. And this discussion is being recorded. It's not being live streamed, uh, but it is being recorded and it can be watched back on YouTube. So the idea is not for me to talk. The idea is for me to talk as little as possible, frankly. Um, we want the, the panelists to talk because you're the experts. So I'm gonna put the questions out there. Do feel free, panelists, Kathy, Stuart, and Ashley, to talk. Don't necessarily wait for me to, to direct questions to you because hopefully things that you guys say is gonna spark off an opinion from somebody else as well. And I'll, I'll jump in as and when needs to be. Um, so the first question, and we're gonna start by putting this one to you, Cathy. Um, do you feel that football clubs in this country generally demonstrate high standards of equality? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because I've been thinking about this a lot lately and thinking that, you know, you can't be a little bit equal. You can't really measure that. I, either things are equal or they're not. Um, and if, if they're not absolutely equal, then clearly they're unequal and we have got inequality. And I, I think sometimes when we think about those terms, we, we get confused sometimes about whether we're thinking about equality or whether we're thinking about inclusion or whether we're thinking about diversity. And I'd say my experience with clubs is they tend to get very confused about all of those areas. Um, and that can mean that they don't make the progress actually that they think that they're making or they want to make. Do you think actually that for a lot of clubs, I think I think they do a lot more in this area than we think. And I think they are more inclusive and diverse often than we think. Definitely more diverse. My experience of working with clubs, and I've worked with about 54, I think, over the years, is that the certainly as a staff base, they're more diverse than we think. But often those people are, are sort of hidden because they're backroom staff who are not seen. It's not the people who are visible. I used to do a lot of kick it outs, raise your game events. And at almost every one, there would be somebody who would come up to me and say, my ambition is to be the first Asian finance director at a Premier League football club. Do you think I can do that? And I'd say, well, no, because there are three already. 
<laughs> but the point was these people are not visible so people don't you know it's the classic thing of if you don't see it you don't think you can be it people don't even realize there are those opportunities within the game sometimes I think and and we end up sort of putting basically all of the white men up front to actually do all of the talking and in those sort of leadership positions and don't actually realize what's sort of going on behind the scenes um but for me real inclusion is about feeling welcome being welcome and feeling like that you were expected. And if I go somewhere and I think, yeah, you really weren't expecting me, then I know that there isn't inclusion. And that used to be from the smallest details of going to a club. And if you were lucky enough to be in hospitality, um, getting the cufflinks as a gift, which those of us that were working in football all the time used to sort of pass around each other's desks, like, like a sort of horse's head, you know, because it, it was just, it was so obvious that you'd think, great, you really weren't expecting me to turn up, were you? Oh, you've given me a tie. The football club ties were always the thing. Um, and it, it can be those little things that can make a real difference. I, I've had so many battles with clubs over the years about really simple things like just actually offering free sanitary products and them saying crazy things like, but won't people steal them? And then they having to explain that you can't steal something that's Free. but also saying to them don't you realize if you make these small gestures it makes people think actually if they thought of these small details they must be looking at everything else you know and then sometimes it's almost like you can force more progress and more change at a club because it's expected of them and sometimes I think our expectations are actually too low so so I suppose my summary is that I sort of feel like our standards should be higher in terms of what we expect from clubs well, this won't be hopefully your only opportunity to speak on this on this particular question as well, Cathy. I mean, Demand more, I would say. <laughs> Stuart, from your point of view, obviously equal playing budgets, equal resources for both men and women on the pitch. Is that is it? Do you see the equality throughout the club off the pitch as well? Um, yes, I do. Um, you know, right the way down from you know Maggie Murphy, who's it's quite a well known name um, in in the football circles um she is our ceo um our um head of football our performance director is a lady called kelly Lindsay, and you know her her role is across the men's and the women's the women's teams uh, her experience is is phenomenal in the game um so yeah what we what we do is 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 we think about it as the who is the best person for the roles not necessarily well you need a man to be looking at the men's side and a women to be looking at the women's side you know to us we've built a very very strong off the field team that supports all of the things we're trying to achieve on the pitch and you know I pick up on something that Kathy was saying about you know the the, the, the almost like how do you bring equality into the into the fans as well you know so so to, to us we we really want to try and reach out and and have bigger crowds for example for our women's game but but our dynamic is to try and get football fans not women football fans it's football fans because to us you know we're lewis fc we're not lewis fc on on the field we're not lewis fc men we're not lewis fc women we're lewis fc and and, and that's that's the approach we take and and we think about a fan is someone who supports lewis football club whether it's our women's team our men's team our under 18s our under 16 girls they support the club and therefore what we try and do is we build our experiences off the pitch based on a one club mentality. And with regards to the question then, do you feel that football clubs in this country aside from Lewis um, demonstrate those high levels of equality? I, I think I'd, I'd echo what Cathy said. I think it's, it's really mixed. I think there are some, some clubs that really take this seriously and I think there's some clubs that pay lip service to it. I think there are clubs that are missing a huge opportunity and they and they, and you know they're, they're this similar clubs to to where we've come from um but they're missing an opportunity to really think about okay how how do we how do we level that playing field um it's an interesting when we first launched our equality program in 2017 um people said well all you're going to do is take resources from one area to 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 equalize the budget um, we did a, that season. Our men's team were promoted for the first time in fifteen years, and our women's team um, gained a place in the FA Championship. So, to us, yeah, equality works. 
and I don't understand why more clubs aren't doing it. Can I pick up on something there, Stuart? Because I think it's really interesting when you talk about, you know, being Lewis FC, because I'm a Liverpool fan and I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a season ticket and to be able to go regularly to see the team home and away. But I know a lot of people aren't. But so many people I know will say, oh, you know, no one could afford to go to Liverpool these days. It's too hard. You know, I just want my kids to be able to go and see players in a red shirt. And I'm like, well, you can. And it's very affordable. Yeah. But you, you know, have you to can go... go and see Liverpool women. You, you, you have, have to, to go, go to Tramway to watch them. Exactly. You've got to go to Tranmere, but it ain't yeah. that far. And you might already be living on the Wirral. You know, yeah. it's, it's, and I think just that mentality is really important that we just start people to get people to realize that, that they can support the football club and they're not being excluded, actually. There's, mm -hmm. there's a way people can be excluded. Ashley, oh, sorry, Kathy. In terms of, of what you do with, with, with Transfer Lab and, and the, the data scouting, I mean, data doesn't lie. Data just tells you. Gives you gives you gives, gives you the stats. It doesn't care what a person looks like, what colour they are, what gender they are. Although in your context, you work purely with women. Is that correct? No. So both sides of the game, we do. Um, okay. So we've, we've been wanting to move into the women's side of the game for a long time. Um, and because we don't collect our own data, we were dependent on some people to collect that data for us before we made that transition. Um, and as soon as that data was available, we moved into the women's side of the game. But I mean, it's, it's really interesting what you say about sort of data doesn't lie. Um, and so sort of one, of, one of the things Kathy, I guess, mentioned was sort of what's seen by fans in terms of, you know, white men perhaps being put out front as the people who everyone sees speak. And then people may be underestimating how much diversity is behind the scenes in the staff base. And um, something our multicultural network did at LCP was run a series of sessions where we spoke about race in different parts of society. And one of the things we discussed was race in sports. Um, and not surprisingly, football came up. And it was quite easy for people within the firm, within LCP, who were football fans and not football fans, to identify campaigns that they'd seen and um, that they thought were positive actions in that area. And, you know, having, having conversations with other colleagues about, say, one of our transfer lab clients, West Brom, has been working with an organisation called Level Playing Field um, to improve the experience of disabled fans or fans who use their disabled facilities. Um, I was in Bristol a couple of weeks ago and I see that Bristol Rovers women's team um, at the start of July will be having a festival of football um, where they're encouraging LGBTQ people to attend. So there are all of these campaigns. I think one of the problems is, and sort of Stuart mentioned this phrase kind of paying lip service to the issue, do we really know how clubs are performing um, in terms of we're seeing these campaigns, are they really having an impact? Um, and the right data, knowing what to measure and coming up with a solution for kind of how clubs should be assessed, a consistent solution, will give us a better idea for how to answer this question. Um, because I think at the moment, we see a lot of examples of what clubs are doing, but don't necessarily know what, what the impact is or what they should be striving for. So how could they do it, Ashley? Sorry to put you on the spot. But it's a good question. So I guess one of the things you, you may want to measure is, um, do fans attending your matches reflect the demographic characteristics of the local area? Are there perhaps certain certain elements who would otherwise come to the certain elements of society would otherwise come to the ground but maybe don't feel comfortable doing that? Um, does your staff base reflect the local population in the same way? Um, yeah, just a couple of examples of <laughs> I could list off many more, but there are certain things you could measure um, to assess how well how well clubs are doing. Well, let's ask let's ask Stuart that question Stuart I mean how how do you feel that the people that come to matches represent the demographics of the area yes I do we we have a, a lot of local support um a lot of um a lot of families come especially on to the women's games um yeah I I, I think I, I would say it does yes Lewis is a very interesting area and that area of East Sussex, it's, um, it's uh, asset rich, rich, cash poor. Um, so consequently, we try and make everything very affordable. And you we, you know, where the dripping pan is, we are, we are five miles, five minutes on the train from Brighton, Brighton's Amex Stadium. And what we're finding is a, is a lot of the Lewis fans who may be two, three, four years ago were going to the bright, shiny thing just down the road. They're now being priced out. So they're now, and coupled with the, the, the better quality of football we're playing and the better facilities, 
we're seeing a lot more local fans who are, who are coming to see to watch Lewis games rather than go to Brighton games. And of course, on the women's side, Brighton women playing Crawley. So it's a huge slog away. And, and yes, they're playing Super League. Um, but, you know, we, we, we feel that, that there's, a, there's a great untapped market that we still need to work on in Lewis, but it is very reflective of the town. And I guess if, if ticket prices were cheaper overall, then we would see people from more diverse backgrounds who are able to attend matches. It's, I mean, this is obviously be, beyond the remit of the question. But do you think that is that an issue here, Ashley, in terms of people who go to football games? Yeah, I, th I think potentially it is. Yeah, it's just another one of those barriers that, you know, potentially stops stops people from going to matches. I mean, I can think of sort of a personal example for me, which isn't, isn't something related to price necessarily, but when I was young, obviously being, you know, mixed race. And I sometimes was slightly apprehensive about going to watch my team Saints Southampton play. Um, not because I ever felt any abuse would be directed at me, but more that abuse would be directed at a player that I felt uncomfortable with and couldn't, I didn't feel able to step in or maybe I didn't feel it was safe for me to step in. And one of the things that, you know, I think is is great now and has had a real positive impact in that is the, the taking the knee gesture and the enduring, you know, the that, that enduring campaign. Um, even though, you know, being, being a fan in the ground and seeing the players you're watching making that gesture um, means that you feel more part of the experience, more comfortable being there. Um, and I can think of other examples of that. I mean, you know, bring up my club again, Saints, um, do it playing Burnley earlier in the year and I was watching them. Um, and we had an extra break in the match. Um, so one of the players could break fast because the game was taking place during Ramadan. Um, so it's little things like that that make people feel like the game is for them um, and make them feel more included. And ticket prices, you know, can can be one of those. Yeah, that was, defi that was definitely a very good thing. It sent a real message of inclusion there. I think we have our fourth and final panellist, Mr. Brian Dean. Good evening. How are you doing? <laughs> very well, thank you. Are you... Are oh. you are you composed? Are you ready to talk? Yeah, it was. Uh, that was a trip. I mean, it's just I'm all hands at all hands at, de at the deck this uh, this evening. But yeah, I'm all right now. I'm done. I'm Good. ready. Good. You've got the tech sorted. So, um, Brian, we've got we've got about thirty three people uh, listening in. We've got our other panelists, Kathy and Stuart and Ashley, and we've started yeah. off by talking about um, the equality standards in football and whether you feel that football clubs demonstrate high standards. Stuart is the chair of Lewis, which has equal resources, equal budgets for men and women on the pitch. Ashley's been talking a bit about, about the data and also about his own experience as a football fan. And Kathy's speaking from an advocacy point of view, fan engagement, getting more people in, getting women, men, people of colour, people from all diverse communities involved behind the scenes as well as on the pitch. From your own experience as a player, involved in football governance as well. Do you feel that clubs in this country demonstrate high standards of equality? Um, I, I don't think they do. And, and it's not, it, it's, it's deeper than just asking whether or not they, they you know, they, they do offer high levels of, of, of equality. I think um, what you've got to do is, first of all, you've got to create a level um, playing field in terms of who you're gonna employ um, and what tends to happen in certainly in the football industry, whether it's on the playing side or whether it's the other internal structures is once people are in place, they bring in the people they want to bring in because that protects their position. So it's less about um, employing somebody because you're going to have a more diverse board or you're going to have more diverse thinking. Everybody, from what I've seen, or most people from what I've seen, are more concerned with protecting their own position, you know, and having sustainability for themselves. Um, and, um, you know, so, so it's... <laughs> for someone like me who's kind of been where I've been and I've seen, I've looked on the outside looking in, and at times I've wanted to get involved, but I can see that you know the the door isn't open necessarily to me you know even with my vast experience because I've been in situations where I present a threat just from that experience you know it 
when we're talking about inclusivity and, and decision making and development, it doesn't extend to bringing in somebody because you want to be a team player. For me, what I've seen, it's all about protecting your position. Um, and it takes people who are very confident to allow themselves to be involved in something where you're going to be taking, um, you know, advice from somebody who, you know, potentially presents a threat to yourself. And I just echo that because I I've seen that so much in football. I think Brian, there's this whole culture which is so much about people just wanting to protect their own position because it's so yeah. competitive and because people have worked so hard to get where they are. Because if you play for Everton, there's only one Everton, you know, or if you're yeah. a coach at a certain club, there's only that one opportunity to you. Even if you're working at a football club, there might only be one football club in your town. You really want to yeah. hang on to that job. You want to hang on to that position. So I think it stifles creativity, actually. I think it stifles any new ideas, like anything yeah. new. People just seem so scared because, as you say, if it's a threat, and they see yep. anybody different with new ideas or that's going to challenge the norm or the thinking, the, the shutters go up. And yep. that, that has to change because it just totally, it's killing the industry, I think. It's killing the sector. Well, it is because what you, you, you're creating a bottleneck then. Um, you know, I, I remember as a kid um, doing a pre-season at Doncaster and I was one of the young kids and I wanted to go you know, I wanted to, I wanted to go in the sprints and everything, but I had all the guys who had been on the, on the lash the night before and the older pros not wanting to look stupid. So they were like, nobody goes past us. And I think that's, that's how I see the industry. You know, it, it's, you get somebody in place and it's at their pace then, and it doesn't always fulfill the best, um, opportunities and development for a club or, or, or an organisational structure. It, it's just, that's how the industry works. And I think that th there isn't a lot of accountability at the, at the top level for that. So um, we're going to go on to, a, on to a poll and ask people what they think about this. But I just want to say one comment in the chat box from Nigel, um, who says, an interesting viewpoint from Brian. But what I can tell you is from having a 20 year retail career is that this happens in a lot of industries. People want to protect themselves and as such bring their own people in. I haven't worked in football yet, but it sounds similar. Thank you, Nigel. Sorry, not Nigel, Neil. Thank you, Neil, for that comment. Please do keep your comments coming in. We'll try and read some of them. And if you've got questions, we're gonna have a, uh, a session at the end. Once we've gone through the questions that Fair Game have put for us, we're gonna um, put some questions to some of the panelists as well. So please do keep it up. Now, this is a bit where it's all gonna get interactive and a bit inter it's interesting. We've got a poll. So um, we're going to go to, now Eileen is our um, event coordinator and she is gonna put up a, uh, in the chat, she's gonna give you a code. And if you could all click on that and go to menti.com. So you can either go in, you can either start up a new browser and put in menti.com and use the code that she's given you, or you can click on that link in the chat box and go straight to it and then vote on the question, which is, do you think most football clubs in this country demonstrate high equality standards? Yes, no, or don't know. So I'm just going to give it a little while for everyone to get the hang of it. I had a little run through um, yesterday, so I know it works. And panelists, do feel free to join in if you want to do that as well. The more opinions are better on this. All this data is going to be collated and looked at later on. If you bear with me, because I've just realised I didn't print off the second page of, that, of, of the proceeding, so I just need to do that right now. Okay, so I think we've got most of the uh, most of the views seem to be in, and um, it might not come as a huge surprise so far. We've only got one person who says yes. Can I just ask, is that any of our panelists who said yes? No, none of our panelists said yes. 
Um, okay, it'll be interesting to know who that why if that person who did say yes, they could put in the, the chat box for later as to why why they why they said yes. Um, 22 saying no and two say don't know. So a few people haven't voted. If you have got time, if you do still want to do it, guys, listening and watching, please do because we are we are really interested in hearing your views. Okay, so let's just l l looking at this then. Um, let's go back to Ashley. Are you surprised that we've got the vast majority saying that they don't? Um, no, no, I don't think I am. I mean, I think if you, if you look across the whole spectrum of clubs, um, I think it, it would be surprising if people said that most clubs have demonstrated higher quality standards. I think you can think of examples where it works really well. We've spoken about Lewis already and anyone aware of them would put them in that bucket, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, I think no is the, the perhaps straightforward answer on this. What about you, Kathy? Any surprise there? Or oh, you're mute. I'm muted. I knew that would happen at some point. Um, no, no surprise there. I think I think it's what you'd expect. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if people feel differently after more of a detailed discussion as we as we move through. So maybe they would. And how about you, Stuart? No, no surprise there. Um, and I'm not necessarily surprised that there is a one because um, some people's sort of universe of, of football in this country might might be just one or two clubs that do a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll always be, you know. I wouldn't I hate using the word outliers but because we shouldn't be talking about outliers about higher quality standards but unfortunately we are so there could be some that actually see those outliers um and therefore they're thinking well yeah actually you know from my experience football clubs do have high standards high quality standards how about you Brian any surprise no none whatsoever and and it and that comes from sort of like I, I was just thinking then about whenever I've been in a club and it's always the same. And um, it comes back to what I think, we, we, you know, in my opinion, which is we, we don't, we, we, we have a very narrow view of where we should be employing from. Mm. Um, and, it, and it doesn't change. And, you know, to be brave enough to, to actually try and change that perspective is to be questioned and it's to be challenged and, it, you know, it, it's like, you know, so, I mean, I, I've been a manager at a club and and I've spoken to a lot of black coaches and so on. And I think the thing is, the underlying thing that is reoccurring is the fact that people feel you get less, less chances to succeed. And that means less support. It's almost like to say, OK, there you go. Have a go at it then without giving the, necessarily giving the same support um, as you would do with somebody else. And, and I've, I've, I've seen it when I, when I was, um, you know, regardless of what my career was as a footballer and the people I played for, including my country, I played abroad for Benfica and so on. When I became a manager and I came back to England to try and borrow players, I could see that I felt that people didn't trust me as a coach, even because. though I've, well, <laughs> because I'm the unknown, because how do we know that he knows what he's doing? It's as simple as that, you know, and, and I, you know, I've reached a point, I reached a point a while ago where I said, well, I can say what I want because I'm not looking for a job as a manager, um, you know, but I, I look at my experiences over 30 years and I, and I, it does get frustrating looking from the outside at what I call the emperor's new clothes with a lot of people. They come in, they say the right things, but actually there's a lot, there's, it's empty behind. And, you know, but that's, that's just my view from what I've seen, you know, and, and there'll be a lot of people who say this and think, well, you know, it, it's not like that, but I can only give you my perspective. So I know as a chair, I'm not, I'm not really supposed to be giving my own experiences, but I am just, I am going to give an experience here actually. So both, I play football for a local women's team who is, there's a men's team there as well. My two girls play for the team, play for the, their, their level, under 12s and under nines. And I would say that the club, this grassroots club, it's commitment to girls and women's football. It's range of different people who play and coach and manage and work is actually of a high standard. 
So if I were looking at my local grassroots football club, I would say they demonstrate higher quality standards. But then when I think about the big picture and I think about the Premier League, then my view is skewed. And I would probably say, actually, I would probably. Yeah. But if I was just a, if I just knew my own local football club, I would say it, it does. But if you're well, if you're saying that that's your local football club and and okay they're getting it right now because they're looking at diversity mm. they're looking at different coaches how long do you think that's going to take to get into the professional game because that's essentially what we're talking about you know it's not going to happen next week or next year you know and and so it's, yeah that's just my opinion on on what you've said which is great and I'm glad it's happening at grassroots because that's where it has to start. You know, but at some stage, you know, we have to start looking at, you know, we have to look at accountability at a higher level mm -hmm. and, and what people are getting and why people are being um, excluded from opportunities. So that's a very good opportunity to uh, move on to the next. I think, Eileen, would you mind taking down the this? Oh, and uh, oh, this is what I'm supposed to ask you. Sorry. There was another point and I didn't ask it. Apologies, everybody. Um, so in which of the following areas do you think football clubs need to do the most work to improve equality standards? So there are four options. If you could rank them in respect of playing staff, second in respect of managers and coaching staff. The third option is in the boardroom or the fourth in is in respect of fans. And then if, if, if everyone could answer that, and we'll have a very quick run through from our panellists and we'll move on to the next section. So with 11 people, obviously this is a bit more complicated, it takes a bit more thought. It's quite interesting already to see how that's shaping up. And it seems to, to um, be very similar to what every, all our panellists have been saying with their own experiences. Okay, so we've got 21 people having 22 now. So yeah, very much in the boardroom, it, it's, that's where people seem to think that the most work needs to be done, followed by in respect of managers and coaching staff, thirdly, in respect of fans, and fourthly, in respect of playing staff. And we'll just do another quick run through. Ashley, um, your views on that? Um, so I think it, it perhaps very much, you know, reflects what Cathy was saying about visibility. And that, and that point, and I think, you know, from most people from the outside looking in, maybe you, you see more diversity, more inclusion at the playing staff level than you do when you see the people representing clubs, the managers out there and things. So, yeah, it's not a surprise to see this. And perhaps that's just linked to, you know, what's most visible for people. And Cathy, what do you think, especially with your, your, um, your fans role? Yeah, oh my goodness. And yeah, I mean, I think I think this is pretty much probably how I voted. I think, yeah, I think I think in the boardroom is such a big issue. And it's it's about leadership and decision making, because we can we can we can fix all sorts of other things. But in the end, if the people that are making the decisions are not a diverse group of people thinking in an inclusive way, then nothing is ever going to change. And the other three below won't change. What do you think, Stuart? Does this tally with your own experiences? Yeah, 100 percent. And. You know, I appreciate that I'm pale male. I'm not going to call myself quite stale yet, and and, and the chair of Lewis. But um, our boardroom is is almost fifty fifty in terms of of gender split, um, and I think that that encourages others to to stand for the board because we have annual elections. Um, because because people see that okay, I can make a difference. I can join that football club. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not an old boys club. It's it's not a closed shop. And I think that 
more people that come in and, and, and bring that diverse range of views, it then flows down through into the management, the coaching, the playing staff and the fans. What about you, Brian? Totally agree with everybody. You know, it's sort of refreshing listening to people who see it that way. Um, and, I, and I'm not here to be pessimistic, but I just feel that the decision makers, a lot of the time, the ones with the power, um, always want to have had their say and they want things to be done how, how they see them. Um, but it has to come from the boardroom. And you need people who are brave in the boardroom to make those decisions. So you need more people in the boardroom. Okay, that's brilliant, guys. Thank you. And thank you so much to everybody who's contributed to that poll. We, do, we now actually have a new second place candidate in respect of fans, just overtaken in respect of managers and coaching staff. But it's pretty, it's pretty even overall. But in the boardroom, definitely, definitely out there on its own. Um, thank you, Eileen, for putting up the, um, that page for us all to look at. Um, so let's move on to the next question then um, for this evening, which is, oh no, actually, let me just, first of all, let me, let me just tell you about next week's session, same time next Thursday. It's going to be talking about good governance, chaired by the former Sky Sports News presenter, uh, Julian Waters. Um, panel of Tranmere Rovers owner, Mark Palios, Radoika Milovic, who's a specialist in governance and regulation, Richard Cable, and the former Minister for Sport, the ex city chair, Nick Hawker, and Ebru Coxal, who's the ex CEO of Galatasaray. And you can, attendees can sign up for free um, via the link in the chat box, which has just been posted there. It'd be great to have lots of people there as well. Um, so, our second question for this evening um, How can the sustainability index help to improve equality standards within football clubs in this country? So, I guess the idea, as we talked about at the beginning, of redistributing funds. There's so much money in football and rewarding those clubs that are well run, that can demonstrate uh, good equality standards. How can that, how can that, those words be transferred into deeds? How can, how can um, the sustainability index help improve equality standards? Cathy, I think we'll uh, start with you again. That's all right. Again. Um... Yeah, I think I want to start with a bit of background on this one, I suppose, because I, I co-wrote the Accessible Stadia Guide, which then eventually, many years later, we managed to get into the Premier League rulebook. And it's, it's, effectively, it's effectively law, really, in terms of the practice that is, that, is, that is sort of looked at in terms of sort of passing that reasonable adjustment test in law. Um, and I also wrote the original equality standards for football. Um, and that was really about setting a framework in place so that clubs had some idea of what is it that's actually being asked of them. So they had to demonstrate where they were and they had to do a lot of benchmarking. And actually the data that Ashley talked about, for instance, is collated as part of that. So I think a lot of this work is being done. Um, having set them up, I, I'm also quite critical of it because, because you know, when you look back, you realise what you would want to change and how that needs to develop over the years. Yeah. And I think there is a danger that, that clubs can sort of think, well, we think we've sort of passed this test, you know. Um, we've collected all our data. I think what was been interesting though is they weren't even collecting the data before. So that, so many clubs aren't normally even collecting demographic data on their staff, which is a fairly normal thing for most businesses these days. It's not weird to do that, you know. So I think I think the standards that there are have really helped to get fans thinking uh, fans to get clubs thinking about what inclusion and diversity should like and should look like. But I think the problem for me is that what we now have is all of these different standards that actually the football, the leagues are asking clubs to meet. Say so they'll have to meet a standing on safeguarding. There's one for equality. There's probably all sorts all over the place. And actually it just gets really sort of fractured. And it means then there's inevitably a hierarchy within the club of actually what are we putting our resources into? And, and what do clubs put sort of... their resources into? Sorry, well, I think, think, I think, you know, more, more attention has gone into safeguarding, for instance, which I would not criticise at all. You know, I think that there are so many standards. I mean, there are standards about, you know, your pitch and your pitch watering systems and your floodlights. And obviously there are plenty of clubs that will look at the Premier League rule book or the Football League rule book, which are really, really big. And in order to be everything, when you get into one of those leagues, you're going to have to prioritise somewhere. And there are certain things that you absolutely are not going to wait, get away with not doing. So you're going to start with those first. And then you're eventually going to get down to your equality standard. And I, I think that was sort of the way it had to be, because when I think back now, I think, gosh, if I tried to actually improve everything all at once and say, let's not have a new framework for this until we've got everything, we'd have never got anywhere. We had to push things through and effectively 
get the shareholders to sign up at meetings when they weren't really reading the papers. And to be honest, half the time they did not know what they'd signed up for. They certainly didn't with the accessible stadia guide because those improvements cost them a fortune. And I swear if they'd realized they wouldn't have done it. But I think, so I think what's important about the sustainability index is that it, the idea is now to bring all of that together so that there shouldn't be that hierarchy. So that actually these are all things that are equally important that you have to do in order to demonstrate that you're running a football club properly. And for me, that is the real, that is the real key. I also just wanted to pick up on, on something else that, um, that Ashley mentioned earlier, you know, the stuff about visibility and, and what it's like if you're, you know, if you're worried about going to a match. I had, I did an interview with Lee Johnson recently, who's now co-chair of Proud Lily Whites. Um, long story, very short, he basically stopped going to football when his own fans were, were chanting um, rent boy chants at Chelsea. It terrified him because he thought if they can do that to them, what happens if they find out that I'm gay because he wasn't out. And the thing that absolutely changed his life because he stopped going for years was he saw the proud Lily White's flag on television at Tottenham Hotspur. And he joked with his friend, if only that was actually a pride flag, it can't be. And then they looked it up online and he discovered, yes, there's actually a fan group there's actually a group of gay fans going to Tottenham Hotspur that I can join and he's now co-chair and he wouldn't miss a match and I just think it really really shows that those things matter. So Stuart as somebody who runs a football club I mean are there so many things as Cathy says there that you have to consider should they all be brought into should it be made more more simple or should things be brought together under one uh, one an umbrella is that just not how it works in, in the real world? Um I think that having metrics and measures that you can aspire to um, or work towards are really important. So to me, the idea of, of having a measure to show how inclusive a club is and what they're doing to move towards a, a higher level of inclusivity um, is really important because many clubs will cut, many clubs will think about this and they'll think, okay, I don't know what good looks like. What, you know, I, I genuinely don't know. Does it mean that, you know, 50% um, of our board should be, you know, it should be um, male and female? Should it mean that we, that we have a very clear programme about inclusivity? Should it mean that um, all of our staff, including our players, have training on um, social awareness? So to me, having something that is, okay, here's some governance. Here's what good looks like. And, and, you know, it applies to other areas of football, things like, as, you know, Kathy was saying about things like the, you know, the facilities, the stadium facilities and ground grading. There we go. There's a measure there. There's something that if I'm a club and I want to move up the leagues, I know I've got to make certain improvements to my ground and there is a standard that I need to follow. So having something that, that covers a quality and a quality standard index, and that, that's what the sustainability index you know, as part of, I think it's a really, really good thing. So you think it would increase high standards, increase standards of equality throughout yeah. football from the highest 100%. level downwards? Yep. And if the if the top teams were, the, were, you know, the teams that people aspire to, if they're doing this and they're, and, and, and they're showing that they're, their compliance and, and what they're trying to do um, against the sustainability index, it will it will encourage and it will motivate the, those below as well. Actually, is, would you agree that with that? Do you think the top teams have to take the lead on this? Is, are we talking about Premier League? They've got to go first with this. I mean, it, it depends how it's implemented in terms of who who has to comply first. I mean, I think if this is something that's going to be under the remit of the regulator and you know all clubs have to comply with it and it's not necessarily going to be a top-down approach it's not going to be those top clubs influencing it it's going to be the regulator saying that this is this is potentially a, something that clubs have to comply with um i really liked you know we, we've sort of some of what kathy said about this joined up approach um and the, you know the sustainability index is a holistic way of looking at how clubs are run um and I'm very positive about sort of the equality standards pillar within that having a positive impact on the other elements of the sustainability index. So 
um, last week, the panel discussion that I joined on financial sustainability, um, listening to that, we have, you know, there's research out there to show that more diverse companies um, are more profitable than less diverse companies. Um, what's to say football clubs aren't, aren't going to be different? We've got kind of good governance, which you spoke about. Um, something we do at LCP is we assess, um, we give consultancy advice to pension schemes. There are trustees looking after pension schemes and we assess diversity within those trustee boards. Um, and, you know, there's evidence that more diverse trustee boards who are looking after members of pension schemes make decisions that better reflect the interests of their members. So having more diverse boards, you know, at, at football clubs potentially means that those clubs are going to make decisions that better reflect the diversity within their fan base. Um, so I'm positive that, you know, this pillar of the sustainability index does have a lot of good, good impacts on the other things we're striving for, financial sustainability, good governance more generally, and fan engagement. So Brian, you spoke before how your experience of working with people at the top echelons of football were, they were, they were interested in sustainability, but sustainability for themselves, which doesn't yeah. really sound like sustainability. How do you think they would react to the things that Ashley has said there? So you bring in a regulator, they clubs have to comply with this. They have to have more di they have to have more diversity at board level and throughout. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would it would be a massive shake up and perhaps one where you know perhaps a lot of people wouldn't know where to start recruiting from um, because you're talking about breaking down a lot of walls um, to bring in people who perhaps wouldn't normally look at getting involved in football because of the fact that it is a closed closed door situation. So, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that we need to do is, is adjust what um, is viewed as success. You know, so we're talking about sustainability of clubs. I think that the more diverse thinking you've got, the more chance you've got of having fresh ideas in. But it's, it's getting that through the door you know um and and i think those are th those are the main problems that i see you know and 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 again i i know that what i said was about it was about challenging you know those people who were within clubs who were putting those kind of walls up. um that's where the resistance is going to come from you know how you actually put something in place to say right this is what you've got to do and the other thing with that, sorry, I'm waffling a little bit now, but the other thing with that is, is that it will get attacked straight away. You know, it, it, there will be a, a mindset created to say, God, here we go again. Right. That's, barriers. that's, yeah. So we have to be aware of barriers. Now, Kathy, I know you have some other points to make. Yeah, I, do, I just think, I think it's what to sort of, you have to go back a little bit to look at what the, what happens at the moment. So at the moment, there are equality standards. There is a framework right across the Premier League, right across the Football League. It's written into the rules. They can be fined if they don't do this work. So this framework already exists with a lot of guidance and a lot of the stuff that um, Brian's mentioned, you know, about like, well, what is what does it look like? What are we supposed to do then? Because the question I would get most often from clubs is, well, yeah, we're keen to do this, but help us out. You know, we're how, as you say, how do we recruit a, a different sort of staff base? You know, how do we diversify the fan base, especially when actually we're selling out every week? You know, how, how do we discourage some people maybe from wanting to buy tickets I mean that's a, it's a really really big challenging thing for some of the clubs when you're selling out every week to actually try and change how that works I would notice for instance at Liverpool that during the in the normal season ticket league matches um, it's a lot more diverse than it used to be but at the Champions League matches midweek when there aren't as many season ticket holders who take up the option on their tickets there's queue for the ladies there are many more black faces, there are many more Asian faces around, you know, it's a very different sort of sort of situation. But I think, so I think it's important to make the distinction between what happens now, which is that all of this exists, but actually how we change it. And I think the big thing for me is, apart from the idea of the sustainability index, you know, encompassing everything, is it's about transparency. Because most people don't realize this is happening. They don't know. Clubs don't talk much about the equality standard. They announce when they've reached another level of it and they've made an achievement with it. But you won't actually see the data. You won't know very much about it. And therefore, people aren't seeing the change that's happening. And if we can't see the change, 
it's sort of irrelevant. Brian, surely a financial incentive is good, would work for most clubs to create better standards of equality. Um. God, that's a that's a, that's a really interesting question because I know what happens when clubs get, you know, when they I've I've seen where clubs get money from somewhere else and it gets diverted somewhere else. Um, so you know, typically what what I can see happening is people do what they need to do to just get the funding. It doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be a change of attitude, um, and, and I think it's really sad. But I'm I'm just. I'm just trying to be as open and honest from, from what I've seen, you know, that there has to be a real shift. It's almost like, you, you know, there has to be, it has to be really, um, the messages that come down have to be really strong. Otherwise, you know, people will find a way around it within clubs, you know, to get what they want and, and make it look on the outside as though they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But isn't it also about sending a message? I mean, Ashley you spoke previously about the match that you were at, which was paused so a player who is um, observing Ramadan could, could break their fast, which sends out a message. If, if boardrooms started adopting better practice, adopting the sustainability index, wouldn't it then become their best practice? It would become the norm for them. The message would be sent out. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, yeah, I think that's true. And sort of as part of Fair Games proposals that, that I'm familiar with, you know, this is not expected to be a, on day one, this is how things are done. It would be this guidance is released, people get used to it, and then over a period of time it's adopted and starts to give it sort of more stronger financial incentives um, for complying with this, this behavior. So, you know, I think at the start, it can provide that indication of what good looks like. And then over time we can ramp it up. So there's a bit more, a bit more weight given to performance in these areas. So it should hopefully that approach may overcome some of the resistance that Brian mentioned about, you know, that initial pushback if it's not really strongly enforced on day one. So we're going to have another poll, but before um, I do put the poll to everybody, I should just let everyone know um, who's watching and listening that, of course, Fair Game is a charity. Um, people working very, very hard behind the scenes to try and reboot football. Um, if anyone would like to donate, um, we're going to post the, the link in the chat box. So it's going to be there. And if you are able to know anything at all, then um, it would it will be put to good use. I absolutely guarantee that. Um, I've also got a couple of comments before we go to the poll as well. Mia says, um, we need to filter out, I think this is related to what Brian said, we need to filter out those who are resistant to change. Change shouldn't be about appearances and superficial, but it should be about a want to change and improve the game. And Ian says, it's one thing having standards, but something else to make sure those standards are actually maintained. In very basic terms, the financial incentives proposed under the sustainability index can only help achieve compliance. But Brian makes a very good point about clubs playing the system. They can be very accomplished at that. Oh, and Neil says, some great points made by Cathy around discouraging some fans to get other fans. Some clubs selling out stadiums, would there be a willingness to do this? I always look at the clubs which still sell hot pies, hot dogs, etc., and not diversifying into other, such as vegan, healthy options for families. Well, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, but lots there, haven't we? So let's have a look at this, this poll, um, a bit of audience interaction. Eileen has just posted it in the chat box. Uh, and the question here will be, do you think adopting the sustainability, sorry, I can't speak. Do you think that adopting the sustainability index would improve equality standards within football clubs in this country? Now this is a simple yes, no, don't know um, answer. And then it's a little more detailed in the second question. I think it is only to be expected that there are going to be quite a few um, don't knows because as we've talked about metrics and it's, it's hard to gauge, isn't it, at the moment? But we'll wait for a few more answers. This got percentages on as well. So 89% saying yes, 11% saying don't know.
Okay, so that's roughly the same amount of people that voted last time. So we'll stop on those figures, 83% and 17%. And actually, could we put up the next poll as well? We'll just carry straight on. Um, assuming the sustainability index is adopted, how long do you think it will take before football clubs' equality standards are at an acceptable level? Less than five years, between five and 10 years, uh, between 10 and 20 years, more than 20 years, they will never reach an acceptable level or they are already at an acceptable level. Okay, so on the 23 people that have responded, it's a, it's quite an optimistic, pessimistic split there. 54% um, saying between five and 10 years, 33% saying between 10 and 20 years, 8% saying more than 20 years, and 4% saying they will never reach an acceptable level. Mm. So Stuart, um, what do you think about what the rest of the participants here think tonight on that um i'm i'm encouraged that things are starting to move and i'm encouraged that clubs um are starting to put equality standards um quite high on their agenda um it it, it needs a tipping point um so so the tipping point is really where fans and and the outside world to football sees real change and they can see the benefit of the change and they can see that the clubs that are really, really pushing for this um, are, are growing, not just their equality point of view, but the, the whole community around their football club. And that to me, that has to happen. There, there has to be that either the tipping point is that, you know, there's a, a small number of big clubs doing it or a large number of smaller or medium clubs doing it. And then they're actually sort of bringing everybody with them. Brian, did you, if you voted, how did you vote? <laughs> it's a really tough one for me, this, because I, I think I was, I was just thinking about it. I think <sighs> my honest answer, how long it will take, it depends on how long it takes for um, it not to be a surprise to have either a female or, you know, somebody like myself in the boardroom making real decisions and not just talking efforts. And, and I can't, I can't really kind of put a, 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 a time frame on that because I see how everything work, how everything changes, you know, um, and it comes back to what I've seen personally and what I think, um, you know, we, we really have got a long way to go, you know, and, and it isn't even as, it's not as subtle as people think sometimes. Ashley, what do you think? How long is it going to take? Well, I've just been thinking back to when I first wrote this <laughs> equality standard and it was probably about, 2008 or nine so that's a bit depressing isn't it so 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 I think I was in the sort of 10 and 20 just thinking actually how long it it takes to really make those changes it's made me think about what I would deem an acceptable level as well so you know it, in that sense maybe it would be it would be longer okay so back a real culture shift culture shift so back when you wrote mm. back in 2009 when you wrote that framework how long would you have said then would have been acceptable? Oh, that's a good, that's a good and how And how much of that has been achieved? I think I always thought it would be a very long road, actually, because I think I felt like this was very much at the beginning of that sort of work of clubs even really thinking about this. I think the shift there has been, I would say, is that when I was first doing that and really getting clubs to try and change in so many ways would be in things like the football, the homophobia week of action where it started with clubs almost not wanting to talk about something like that at that stage. 
and then they would say, oh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll get involved. You know, you don't have to persuade us. And then another couple of years later, it was actually, no, no, we, we're just doing it. It's fine. Um, and then some clubs would actually say almost, can we? Like they needed some sort of permission to do these things. Is it okay if we support this? Yes. Then it changed to just how do we do it? And now they're often flying a lot of the clubs and they don't need people like me pushing them to do it because they've actually come quite a long way. So I think there's been quite a culture shift, but it's not right throughout the game. I Ashley, think, as we said before, it's in pockets. Ashley, what about you? I mean, you seem to have quite a positive view on what can be done. Where would you where would you have said this? How long would you have said it would have taken? For the yeah, so I mean, I voted in this. I, I put it in the between five and ten years. Um, and the reason why I'm optimistic about this is because there seems to be a lot more pressure in this area through efforts like, you know, like Fair Game and other initiatives out there. And, you know, what Stuart said about there being a tipping point. I think potentially that tipping point is near where clubs really feel the pressure to get on board with equality standards. Um, and once we get there, you know, I feel, I feel there can be really fast change. So I think there's, a, you know, many reasons to be optimistic about this. Do you think they're feeling the pressure morally or the pressure financially? A good question. And, you know, I think that there could be financial pressure if the sustainability index is adopted. Um, either could work. I'd like it to be a moral pressure, if I'm honest. I think that's a, that's a nicer story. Um, but yeah, I think either can work, and maybe the you know the financial pressure will push people into into making some of those decisions that they thought about previously, but you know haven't quite got there. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, now let's let's have a look at the chat box and see if we can get some um, some questions from people. Uh, Eileen, would you be able to put the, the take the poll away, please? Oh, crikey, sorry. Someone had there's some good questions at the top about female. Um, and excuse me, bear with me, please, everybody. So be, uh, there's a question here saying, do you panelists think it's strange that not one of the 92 men's teams in the football league has a female manager and never has done? Is there a woman? Why a woman? Is there a reason why a woman couldn't manage an elite men's team? I'm going to put that one to Stuart. Um, there's absolutely no reason. Um, I think that there are some fantastic um, A-licensed coaches, uh, um, female A-licensed coaches, both in this country and abroad. Um, and there needs to be a club that's brave enough to, to do it. And, and I think that's the key thing. I think if you'd have gone back... 10, 15 years, the, the, the concept of having a, a woman as a CEO or a woman as a chair in a club was, again, almost unheard of. Now we've broken through those barriers. I don't think it will be very long before there is a woman manager in the English game. Um, I would like to think it's in the professional game, but I, I, I think it will happen within... The, the English game, so you're probably looking at the top ten levels of English football, but that will happen. That will happen soon. There, there's already coaches out there, um, and some really, really good coaches. So somebody like Natalie Henderson, who did so much work up at Newcastle as an A licensed coach and worked with their boys' academy. You know, people like people like her. You know, a, a really, really fantastic coach. And at the end of the day, it's about ability. So it shouldn't matter about sex it should be about ability so the tracy has says amanda staveley has made a big shift at the top flight and the support to the ladies team within the club now um tracy can you just let me know which club you're talking about because i don't i don't know if anyone's newcastle, newcastle. 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 Okay. yeah so it's so a newcastle um since so this year um they've tried to bring newcastle women's team closer to the men's team they they played uh, they played a game at st james's park um they played a number of their games at, at Newcastle Falcons rugby ground as well. So, so yeah, it's great. What I'd love to see, and 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 again, if 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 Amanda is really serious about developing the Newcastle team, I don't understand why wouldn't they be playing at St James's Park every week? Because they'll get five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand people watching them, and it just sends out the message that this is how important we think our women's team is. That they're going to share the same facilities as our men's team. Um, Andy McBride has a question. What are the panellists' view of the Rooney rule with regards to ethnic minority candidates for coaching? 
I've seen mixed views. Anyone want to pick that up? Well, I, I was involved in quite a bit of this because I was on what was a Black Coaches Forum looking at some of these issues at the time. And yeah, that there were mixed views. I think I think one of the dangers, as I think it was Chris Eaton said at the time, said, I just don't want to be on everybody's interview list. Mm. I think he literally thought he would end up sort of being on everyone's interview list and sort of shipped around the country because because the idea basically was about um, the reading rule is about who you interview. So what we did at the time was we really tried to put in measures to to improve the pool of people because the point was people weren't even getting on the first rung of the ladder. And I think the other thing that's really changed in coaching, which I hope means that we will see really real big change in this area, is that coaching is no longer about playing until you're in until your late 30s and then and then becoming a coach. The really good coaches are often people who've been coaching from about the age of 19, 20. Mm -hmm. So it's changing the model of actually who is accepted and seen as being somebody who's a good coach. And it's no longer the case that you expect to be playing. You look at Rafa Benitez, you look at Jose Mourinho, you look at a lot of these players. They've not been, they've not been elite players. They've often suffered injuries quite early on and gone into coaching. So a question for Brian, perhaps. Um, do you think, Brian, the, the football industry is full of people who actively discriminate against people from certain groups? Or do you think it's not, this industry is not doing enough to make working football an attractive option? To people from those groups. Oh, <laughs> that's, a lot, that's a lot you've just thrown at me. Um, I don't think anybody's actively. Um, I don't think there's anybody actively looking to stop opportunities. I just think it comes down to that the fact that I don't think that there are enough people at the top level who trust their own um, convictions, and so they don't want to be responsible for making a wrong decision. So they go with the safer option. And um, yeah, you know, I'm drawing a lot from my own um, experiences here, but I, I kind of, uh, you know, that's, that's what I've seen and that's what I picked up and that's what I've looked at and thought, well, you know, does this chairman or does this owner really see you know, somebody like myself as the leader of that organisation, and what does it? What does that really represent? Um, and that's just how I've just how I see it, and just how I saw it. And, and I know it sounds sad, but it's uh, it's an unconscious thing. And um, you know, but again, I I kind of I, you know I went through the process of doing my badges. I went through the process of becoming a manager. I went abroad to get my opportunity simply because I wanted to be able to say, well, I've, I've seen it and I can say it because I've been through the system. When I came back, I went for an interview realizing afterwards that I only got interview because the club that gave me the interview was a club that had signed up to, to do exactly what we've been talking about. And imagine what that makes me feel like, especially with my playing background and realizing that I'm just a token effort. So we really have got a long way to go. And, and, and the problem for me is that we, we spend a lot of time talking and we don't have enough brave people who want to make the decisions, who want to know what somebody like me knows about football, you know. Um, and, and this isn't a job interview, by the way. You know, by far it isn't. I, I'm just kind of... I haven't, I haven't got any jobs. Can, Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I can only draw on the conclusions that I've come to um, and, and pass that information on so that people can reflect that, you know, this is this is actually what it's like out there. And you do get, you know, I, I needed to go through the process of, you know, of, of doing my badges, take, just getting up, going and living in Norway for two years, using all the instincts that I got to get me at the top, using all the experiences that I got working under Terry Venables, George Graham, Howard Wilkinson, Dave Bassett, Graham Soonis, Alan Pardew, Willie Donerkey, um, all, all of these people, Graham Taylor. You know, when I, when I had my interview, I actually said, I'm bringing all these people in every day. And I went into this interview and, and I saw that I just wasn't flavor of the month. So what? How? How can I have an equal effort if I'm bringing all that to the table, you know? And um, you know, it's still not enough. You know, it, it's 
you know, I, I came back and um, and I, I'm just trying to give some 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 understanding here. But but, but when I um, when I came back from Norway and I, I ended up going down, I asked, I was asked to go down to one of my former clubs um, to just be around the place because I was well respected and everything. Um, and, and I used to do a few sessions with some of the players, you know, just striker stuff. Um, they ended up, at the end of the season, they asked me to do the under-15s role, right? Yeah. And they asked somebody who hadn't even got their, finished their B licence, they gave him the A-teams role. Now, I wasn't going to have that anyway because it, it didn't make sense to me with what I wanted to do. But I have to I have to let you understand what the perception is and what what is so real about what we're talking about because it's too late for the likes of me now, you know. It's taken me ten years to get ten years longer than it should have done, you know. So let there you me, go. Let me now put I think one last question about back to the sustainability index. Sustainability index itself. Put this one to Ashley. So it's a question from Chris. The financial pressure the sustainability index could put on clubs to be equal, could be really helpful. But do you think the pressure fans and others that could put on clubs that score badly on equality could be even more helpful? It's a good point. Um, personally, I think there'd be a better reaction to having some kind of carrot rather than a stick to punish clubs with. I think it's a more positive way about looking like it. And I mean, some of these measures we're talking about, you know, having good equality standards has a cost. Um, and if we are directing money towards clubs that have good initiatives in that area, we are helping cover some of that cost indirectly by doing that, by distributing money in, in, you know, along those lines. Um, so my preference is from a carrot, but you, know, you can probably see by my optimistic attitude to, to a lot of this, um, maybe that's too, a too nice a way to think about this. Maybe some kind of punishment would be better, but you know, I, th I think the carrot is a good idea. I guess maybe both will be in operation. Now we do have lots more questions, but I think we do need to wrap up. So. Sorry to all those we didn't mention. Um, not Neil had said, uh, should UEFA have put the Euro, the women's Euros on bigger, like the Etihad, instead of Man City's smaller sister, smaller sister ground. There's been small questions about female refs appointing a female for the wrong reason, perhaps as a stunt, instead of because they're actually the best person for the job. But I think, sorry to those guys whose, whose questions didn't get asked, but really thank you for putting them all to us. Um, Follow Fair Game on Twitter at Fair Game. I think that's right. Tell me if I'm wrong, Fair Game people. Um, and do sign up for next week's session. And if you would like to donate, please do. Um, but just before we wrap up, there is one more poll. No, actually, let me thank you all first of all. Let me thank you before we wrap up. Thank you to Ashley Mould. Thank you to Kathy Long. Thank you to Brian Dean. And thank you to Stuart Fuller. Thank you to Fair Game. And thank you to Eileen, who's been sorting out all the technicals in the background. Um, and if you can go to menti.com one final time, and if you could all write three words. Oh, sorry. One other thing I've got to mention. I want to thank the sponsors as well, who are Transfer Lab and Campbell Tickell. Thank you. Um, so if you click on the last uh, poll that you've been that's in your chat box, and if you could write three words that describe tonight's discussion. So the way this works, obviously, is the words that are used more regularly, come up more than once, start to grow bigger. So we've got some good words coming up in the middle there so far. And everyone's spelling is quite good. Can't see any major typos. Of those words, if you go all the panellists, of the words you can see so far, just give, tell me which one you like from, from this discussion and for, for the future of football. Of those words, which word would you, would you take away from this, Ashley? 
insightful clearly is it reflects well on some of the panelists I dare I say it's maybe some of the others rather than me being insightful there but I think you know optimistic I think is a, a, a nice way to end obviously. how about you Kathy uh, I think hopeful is the one that makes me most pleased I like thought provoking but yeah hopeful is good to see Stuart positive is that how and, you're feeling as well yeah hopeful and positive what about Brian uh, hopeful that's good. That's great. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you to all the panellists, the sponsors and everybody who joined in. I hope that everyone found that useful and exciting. Goodbye. Bye. Did the recording end? Are we still recording? It, oh, the, the poll went down. That's what happened. I thought we just ended, which is why I did that abrupt end. We <laughs> haven't gone. Thank you, everybody. Um, if everyone, because all the panelists, just give everyone a final wave and then we'll, we'll, we'll wave, we'll end it for, for good. Mm. Thanks, guys. It's great to meet you all. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Don't forget yeah. the next sessions on Thursday. Bye bye. <laughs>